All right, welcome everybody. It's back. It's Monday. It's a special event. There's a person that lead the group. All of these great things coming together today. Hillary, we're very happy to have you here leading our conversation today. And so I will um, say nothing else except thank you. And I look forward to participating. Take yes. it away. It's yours. Even construction and noise. Even with the construction and noise. Yeah. And so if you're just here, I just told everybody I have construction. So I'm going to turn my mic off and only pop in once in a while. Yeah, so I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about um, mental health and assistive technology. Um, for those of you who don't know who my, I am, my name is Hillary Goldthwaite Fowles. I am an instructional design specialist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, and that is a, um, a pediatric. It's a research hospital too that works with kids with various disabilities, and one of the arms is mental health. So a little backstory, and then we'll get right into the discussion of it. I'm also a private AT um, specialist. I do con consultation and training um, for entities on AT, UDL, um, and inclusive learning practices. So I wear many hats, but I had noticed before, even before COVID had happened in my former setting in RSU 21, which is a really affluent school district in the Southern part of Maine where, I'm, where I live, um, there were a lot more 504 plans and requests for assessments based on mental health, including anxiety and depression to the point where kids were not coming to school or kids were having really, really struggling with coursework or just the pressure of, I have to get a 1600 on my SAT and I need some accommodations and I need to get in this college. So it was very fascinating to me that there's this growing trend of mental health. Like, what's up with this? And there was this article about high achieving students being labeled an at, another at risk group because of the pressure and it was creating anxiety depression and some ptsd that being said i had started kind of working on that and thinking about my own personal mental health journey as someone with um diagnosed generalized anxiety disorder i was looking at tools in my toolkit to kind of help me also because if i'm not showing up as well as I could be, I can't show up for the people that I serve. So I've done some, and also to support the students that are in that setting, like what tools do I have as an AT specialist that could potentially help in condition, in you know, conjunction with best practices in terms of therapy and other mental health interventions that you know center the needs of kids. Um, and so then COVID happened, as we all know, and we don't want to go back and talk about it, but. What really came to light for a lot of people is mental health matters. I mean, it affected all of us in different ways. Some of us more than others, some of us less, and that's all variable, right? So for me, what I learned from that too was the importance of addressing, actively addressing the issue at hand, which is mental health and removing the stigma around mental health. And also, how can we work together to support mental health practitioners and ourselves and each other in not just removing the stigma around mental health, but ways that schools and AT providers in, in this instance can support mental health. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I do have a generalized anxiety disorder. I also do have um, post PTSD. So I do have a uh, trauma history that I had been pretty much ignoring for a long time and COVID kind of made sure that I could not ignore it anymore. Um, this fall was pretty bad for me personally, but I'm in, in terms of realizing that I need to address this. It really helped me to see that I'm not the only person that this impacts. This impacts everybody. And if I'm having shame and guilt and all of that and addressing it, what's happening to kids. And um, one of the projects I work on at Kennedy Krieger is with uh, pediatrics and neurodevelopmental pediatrics. And so when we think about mental health, I'm talking about the whole lifespan, birth on up, because we also have to think about mental health from the very beginning. And how are we creating environments and supporting kids and developing healthy coping strategies, healthy mechanisms, ways of being executive functioning and also addressing any comorbid conditions such as autism or ADHD or any other disability where mental health does come into play. 
So I will be sharing some resources, but I do want to guide the conversation a little bit with everybody. So this isn't just me yapping at you for an hour. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. And so feel free to post in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and let's um, get started here. As we know, there is a mental health crisis in this country, especially for children. So what are you seeing in your settings around mental health, number one? And to dovetail onto that, how do you think or how could you envision AT potentially supporting children or educators or yourself in managing mental health? I'm going to put um, in the chat some reference articles. And at the end of this, too, I have, as Alyssa will love, I have a wakelet for y'all with a bunch of resources and um, things that you can use, not just AT, but other articles to give you context as well. So let me put the question in the chat too. So you have it. So you're like, what is she, what was she at? What was that question again? There you go. It's Monday, it's 1209. Yeah. So what are some things that you're seeing? Have you noticed about mental health in schools? I don't work in a school, but I used to work at a youth, um, like mental health center and like, mm -hmm. a youth, like support center, basically. And I think I'm just kind of another big thing that's been really big recently is just noticing because mental health is so much more talked about how many kids, at least where I worked, because they had a safe space to open up about that. Just noticing how many more kids are seemingly now it's like such a bigger thing when really it's probably always been there. It's just the fact that now kids are comfortable enough to like talk about it. And some aren't, I'm not making a generalized statement there, but the fact that a lot of kids are able to come into like a safe space and like things are talked about more now than they used to be. I think that that's definitely been helpful too for kids. I think that's a great point, Peyton. And thanks for sharing that too, because you come from it from that standpoint of a therapeutic setting where you are actively addressing mental health. And that's awesome because we need that. But also kids being able to say, hey, I'm not doing all right, or I'm noticing this and I need some help. And it's not a sign of weakness or that there's something fundamentally wrong, but I just, I'm not, you know, my tools aren't working and I need more than what I'm getting right now. Right. Absolutely. I think that that's like, even, even as the age groups kind of get younger and younger, I mean, some of the kids that I grew up with still see mental health as like a sign of weakness. And then like our parents and our grandparents think that certain things don't exist. They're like, what's anxiety? Like what's depression? Like, why do you have these things? How are they, why can't they just go away on their own? And now as kids are like younger kids are kind of recognizing that like it's okay to feel how you feel and get the help that you need and advocate for yourself, which is super important as well. Exactly. That's a great point. And Irene has saying too, it does affect staff. And that's a really big point because, because not being supported as a staff member in how to address mental health or not having access to services for mental health as well um, really helps. And then um, yes, Florida is a whole of the ball of wax, Alyssa. Um, I am seeing more PD for SEL, but you can't even use the word SEL on that. And don't get me started. We're talking about mental health. That's going to cause another mental health issue, and I'm not going to do that today. But we have to acknowledge that because that, that's problematic. Yeah, when we talk about barriers, see, I was going to try to be good and just put it in the chat and not talk. But when we talk about barriers, uh, you know, there's that language barrier of like, how do we talk around a thing? when sometimes the only way to adequately address a thing is to talk right to it. And yet we don't always have the ability to use those words. You know, I have quite a few young people who 
either prior to the pandemic or because of the pandemic are full-time hospital homebound. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we've got kids who were with same age peers up until that time. And then their world just shrunk. And then it's a, 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 a more difficult conversation of like, okay, like what's really going on for this, this young person. It's not that they all of a sudden hate school. It's maybe they are depressed or they've got other things going on, but um, we have to navigate very carefully in Florida as an agent of the school system because our parents, uh, par- the parents' rights legislation means that we have to get signed permission for everything, including like we're checking your vision at school. And, uh, you know, it, it adds extra layers of complication. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's PD about, I'm seeing that Natalie was saying there's more PD because you're probably not from Florida on social and emotional learning, which, you know, that also has some nuances too, you know, to be perfectly, because sometimes some social and emotional learning or just wellness, like just the whole child, you can all say the whole child, but I just finished a course on understanding the whole child and that marries ASCD's whole child indicators with the engagement guidelines of universal design for learning and Castle's competencies. So pick and choose, but there are intersections of those and where do you find them? And then how do you look at the child as a whole and what supports do you have in order to address those needs? I've always said, if kids aren't available to learn, well, forget about it. You can't just force them. They're not available because there's so many factors and it's overwhelming for a teacher. There's a lot on their plate, but who are your people that you can go to to get some help and get some support? And also just a systemic thing about not feeling humanized as an educator. And I'm bold and say that. Mike knows me, I'm bold. I'm just going to say it because there's aspects of education, that love of teaching that drove that gets kind of lost because you're kind of not humanized sometimes, especially in like special education and dealing with disability. It's almost like, you know, you're othered in a way and that spills down to kids and that affects mental health. That affects your mental health. That affects your ability to address what's going on with kids and your ability to support them effectively. So in, in that being said, Um, I do have another question here because um, during COVID-19, this is a worldwide increase of mental health. Um, There's a 25% increase in the rates of diagnosed anxiety and depression worldwide since the pandemic. How do you think assistive technology could potentially support the management of anxiety and depression um, in terms of this. Oh yes, caregivers and families, parents, so important, Jen. Thank you for bringing that up because that, you know, thinking about being at home and kids were at home, parents are at home working and managing all of that and not knowing what to do, how to do. And that's a lot of pressure and that's a lot of fear. And that, you know, the unknown was very scary for everybody. So And then coming out of that, how do you help support somebody that's having a hard time coming out of that? I'd also add in, I think, parents of children with like complex Mm -hmm. or just any disability, I think there's a lot of mental health issues that go along with just the lifelong caregiving, Um, even adults. um, You know, I have adult AAC users that still live at home and um, that transition into adult living and even like funding for adult living or being able to find caregivers to come in and provide support to that adult, um, you know, is so inconsistent and trying to find uh, people to to provide that support right now. Um, I know a lot of people, um, Lydia Dolly was one who lived, um, she's an AAC user and she lived in Wisconsin and she couldn't find people to come in and support her independent living and then ended up moving back home to, I think she's from Iowa or somewhere like that um, because because she couldn't find people, you know, to to help her. So I think there's a lot of that, um, just a lot of pressure on families. Um, And I certainly 
see that when I'm sitting in IEP meetings, um, you know, and we're adding to this list of, of things or we're focusing on those deficit areas and you just see parents and caregivers faces just, you know, really change within that meeting sometimes. So I always try to remember the families and their sure. point of view. Absolutely. It's such a great point too, because they do have that perf- and they're living it. That's a lived experience that you have to honor and understand at some point. And some parents, even without kids with complex disabilities, some parents have mental health challenges or mental health disorders that are either undiagnosed or they have their own trauma history from being in school, had a really negative experience. How many IEP meetings have you sat at and a parent has said, I hated school. I was labeled. I was done that, 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 that. And now genetic, like they have another child, they have a child and we're at the table and they're like, I don't want this for my kid because of their experience. So there is a lot of open dialogue and trust building you have to do and understanding the trauma that that has caused for that parent. And sometimes it's just as simple as saying, I'm really sorry, like affirming, just, I'm really sorry that happened to you. What can we do to make sure that doesn't happen to your child? Because we don't want to repeat that So here's what we can do. How can we work together so that your child is getting what they need, but then also has those tools to feel empowered, to advocate for themselves, to learn, to understand how they learn and to give you the tools so that you can learn, you know, so that you're not made to feel bad or different because you have a disability or you have something that's different from what's perceived as the norm. It's a little more complicated than what I'm talking about right now, but I just think it's important to just honor someone's story, you know, and sometimes that's effective in addressing someone's mental health is just saying, you know what, I see you and I'm I'm sorry, you're having a hard time right now and it's okay, we'll get through it instead of just making someone feel bad because I can't manage my emotional makeup and I can't deal with that. You've got to check yourself first before you, you know, and we know that like as what we do, but sometimes it's really hard to do that when you have all these other things going on. Alyssa had a comment here too about back to AT, about using like calm um, breathing reminders, using calendar reminders, stuff that's not as obvious to peers, but something that's built in to our phones, to our iPads, to laptops that can help, um, you know, address managing, you know, or, you know, managing your anxiety. Um, Yeah. I think it's that inconspicuous, which it's Monday. So I had to look up how to spell it. Um, Mm -hmm. like that, that angle of it's the same way why I can get, you know, uh, a student to buy into an audiobook Cause it's like, Oh, it just looks like they're listening to music. Whereas a peer doesn't know that that's what's happening. Um, I think it's that initial buy-in of something inconspicuous. And hopefully if they find a good positive result from it, they start to not care whether somebody notices that they're using it or not, but at least for that initial buy-in, having it be something that they can kind of run under the radar a little bit and utilize it. Right. Right. Cause that then there's like a double stigma, right? When we talk about supports for certain kids and it's like, Oh, but wait, if we took it a step further and made it more universally designed where we're sharing, you know, with our people and our, you know, with a social worker or with a guidance counselor to some supports for mental health. I mean, just an example in my former setting was I worked with our social workers that were, you know, in special services on, hey, what about, have you considered an iPad, for example? There's some really cool, like emotional regulation apps that can help address mental health. Sesame Street has some really good apps. And I'll share those on the wakelet for you a little bit that can help or oh this kid is using the zones of regulation as part of their plan or oh we're the whole grades now using it so let's put the zones on an ipad so that we can do some one-on-one so that we can generalize that to another set you know to the classroom setting for example or just even having a playlist for calming music that kids can listen to or access when they need to or just play music in a room that creates um a better kind of atmosphere or environment for kids um, moving, you know, different tones and things like that can kind of work in reducing, you know, um, anxiety and, and depression in terms of that. So I want to flip it too, because we are talking about disability, but we have to talk about 
other isms, right? So we know, and I know if I'm living in a certain state, I can't say it, but I don't, so I'm gonna say it. Um, we know that systemic racism, ableism, sexism, all of it does impact mental health. We do know there's an article out to that, um, and this actually is, there's a, a couple I'm gonna put. These are also will be in the wakelet, so don't worry if you don't catch them on time. They're all in, they'll all be in there for you too. But especially impacting girls, adolescent girls, the CDC posted um, a new article recently that um, mental health in teenage girls is really um, epidemic. It's an epidemic. The girls are really struggling, social media and the ways, body, all of it, it's not good. And then we're talking about kids who are struggling with their gender identity and you know their sexuality and what are we doing to help support them instead of making them feel bad because this is how they feel. How do we use mental health and inform um, those practices and also access, right? I'm a white woman who has their doctorate and make decent money. I have really good health insurance. I have access to mental health services pretty quickly, actually, and my insurance will pay for it. How do we ensure too, and this is not an AT related question, but in that way, because there's that access location people can't get to a clinic, maybe they don't have reliable internet to access tele telehealth. Um, and how can we also culturally be responsive? Because what you might do for me is going to be different than what you might do for a Black woman or someone who's Native American or someone with a disability, even. Um, one of the things you'll see in the Wakelet, too, is there's a recent podcast from Kennedy Krieger on autism and mental health and how to address it and what Kennedy Krieger is doing to address those things in their clinic. Um, and it's true, Jen, not enough services. The wait lists are really long. Um, and then there's not enough mental health providers in schools even to, to address that. And, it you know, to have a, a certified social worker you know, beyond a school counselor, that's a social worker that isn't just for special education, but is for everybody because mental health knows no bounds, right? Um, you know, and that, that wait list does impact that time. And men and boys, 75, good Mia, that's a really good point. Men are really struggling, like every, nobody's okay. And if you are great, but nobody's really okay, whatever that means, there's no such thing. You're variable, some days you're better than, but men are really, yes. And I, you know, my son, I, am, I have a son, I have a stepson and a son. I'm very, very, very upfront about addressing their mental health. Um, you know, my, my husband and I both are in there, have, have gone to therapy. I'm in therapy. I have no shame in that because I look at my grandparents who my grandmother had agoraphobia. She had really, you know, anxiety and depression. My grandmother, my mother's side had really bad anxiety. And I'm like, if you had, if that stigma wasn't there, that you thought you were something was wrong or something was bad about you. I wonder like what their lives would have been in managing their mental health um, as opposed to now. So I'm very much about breaking those cycles of shame and stigma about that. And I, I do what I need to do to take care of myself because I matter and other people matter. So I wish people had that concept that I matter enough to take care of myself. If you were sick, you broke your leg, you would put a cast on it. You would get that treated you had cancer, you would get that treated. This is no different. And I didn't realize the impact until you actively addressed it. I didn't realize like how really bad if I was until I actually addressed it. I went, oh boy, I got some work to do. And a lot of it too was coming off of just being in K-12 and not a good setup and just, yeah, anyway, it's better now, but the lack yeah. of providers is a big deal. Very I was going to say, I, I totally agree with Natalie. And I think part of it, it goes back to, I mean, it's a bad loop, but you know, if you choose as a provider, like me as an OT provider to accept the state funded or Medicaid insurance, your reimbursement rate is tiny. So I think it's hard for a provider to build a caseload of, of those who need it, whether it's social worker, licensed mental health counselor, um, because that rate of reimbursement is significantly lower, not that a Blue Cross or anything else is drastically much higher. But I think it's so low that you know, they feel like, okay, well, I got to keep my business afloat. So like maybe they put a cap on the number or they decide, oh, I can't even go under contract with that provider at all because they're going to reimburse 50% of the state rate. And I'm like, well, 
I understand, you know, there's that business viability, you got to keep the doors open and the lights on and like wanting to do what's right. Um, we're very fortunate in our district that we have social workers that are attached to every school. Um, and they're a mix of licensed mental health counselors or, um, or, uh, MSW social workers. Um, but even that, I know that their caseloads are very large right now. Um, so we've got kids that are getting services through the school that would potentially, I mean, I know we've got lots of providers in our town, but there's still not enough providers right. when you look at need versus <laughs> scheduling opportunities. There's just a huge gap. But yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous what the reimbursement is. So I understand from a provider side why it's really hard to be like, oh, I'm going to like you have to, you have to either have some kind of grant funding <laughs> to supplement it or know that you've got, you know, you, and you can't cap your caseload. If you, if you're a Medicaid provider, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm only going to take 25 Medicaid cases. I don't know how to fix that. It's just a problem. <laughs> it is. It's, it's those hoops. Like it's so, there's so many barriers for that type of, and it's like, it's a service. It's great, but there's so many barriers for the provider to do that. I, there are some, you know, even in my experience, what kind of insurance do you have? And I don't take state funded insurance because it's so prohibitive for me too, unless you're in a big clinic or a larger setting or hospital base, at least in Maine, it, it's really problematic because there are people that desperately need those services and can't access them because they don't have the right type of economic, you know, stability to act, which is wrong. I mean, you know, that's needs to change too. And I, I don't, that's a policy-based thing. That's got to be a funding-based, a, a reimburse, an insurance, but that's got to be something that just changes. And that's, but that has to do with policy. So maybe it's one of those writing your state reps and looking at lo local government. Some pro providers though will do this where they have a service that's not insurance, but it is, and you can sign up for it. And it will cover a portion of it without having to go through the rigmarole. Yeah, I think we've been most back yeah. end submit. We've been most successful using a combination of thankfully ESSER funds, ARP monies right now, combined with grants to fund even wraparound services for kids privately. Um, I do, I do notice, and I don't know if this is a national trend, but the access for our students who have more complex disabilities and more complex needs. Uh, there's just a lack of providers who are aware of how to work with somebody who uses a communication device. And mm -hmm. I'm going to blank on her name, but an AAC user presented at ATIA about access. At, I, I really wish I could find her name. I'll, I'll send the, the information to you, Hillary, to add to the wakelet, um, but did an amazing job oh. kind of from the research end and from the her own mental health kind of end to talk about what do providers need to know. Um, and we just don't have providers in our area. Like if I had a student I needed to refer, I have zero starting space of somebody who is familiar with an AC user, let alone, you know, an autistic young, young adult who may be verbal, like they just don't have those strategies in their toolbox or space in their schedule. I think I might already have it on there. Yeah, I think I do. It was the Prenti, the distinguished lecture. No, it was a different one. Yeah, I'll find it while I'm here. That'd be awesome because I can add it because I have one up there, but another one would be awesome. Mia, I love your, um, free tech, like common headspace, um, using that for everybody, which is great. Um, those are great free apps too, that you can use with kids. Like I love the 30 second, just take a breather from calm that you can put on a, on an interactive board and just kind of recenter, um, before you get ready to learn. Did anybody ever use brain gym? way back when have anyone ever heard hello see Alyssa's lot a little smiling it's, because it OT. is a OT gig yes and I, and I think you'll see that. little vestiges of it cross crawl you'll see little things that still poke out and somebody may not actually be able to tell you like where they learned that thing from but there are little vestiges of brain gym still hanging out there yeah and that's a very low tech like easy like that I would depending on what the activity was when I taught I would do a brain gym exercise based on what it was what we were doing in that moment and I would do it to start the day and then when we, when we would come back from transition you know for from a break or lunch or something and then at the end of the day sometimes kids would you know go home and they're like you know really 
this regulated. So we would do something very calming at the end of the day before we left to go home so that they would be in a, a better space to be home and, and, you know, be more present for, for parents so that, you know, their, their needs were, and that was kind of, that was kind of neat. I love, I love bring Jim. Oh, near pod and flip. Yes, they do. Book creator has some stuff out too, which is pretty nice. Are there any other AT supports that people might have that um, we have not gone into or talked about or want to see perhaps? Oh, the Microsoft features, yes. Some of it too, like even just, not just mental health in general, but thinking about like presentation anxiety and uh, Microsoft PowerPoint has a presentation coach, which you can rehearse and you can record yourself and it gives you feedback on your pacing and how you're doing and your timing and timing of slides, and then you can redo it. And sometimes you even just send that recording to somebody as a stream video, and then you're not presenting in, you know, oh, weekly mental health email for Microsoft. Yes, I think I know that. That's pretty fantastic that they do that. And then, you know, when we're talking about uh, present pals, another pre presentation app. I'm sure you've all heard of present pals. So that's fantastic um, in terms of providing that support from anxiety. Mia also turned me on to this app called Sensa. And it's in the wakelet, it's at S E N S A dot com. And what Sensa is, and this is something I struggle with, is procrastination station, right? Paralysis by analysis. Oh, God, I have all this stuff to do. And I'm just going to say, because I don't know where to start. What it does is it gives you an opportunity to journal, track your mood. You can take some assessments, it is paid. And then you have activities that you can do or things that you're learning about why your emotions are tied to procrastination. So getting more in touch with that and the why behind them and what you can do to kind of shift your mindset around it has really been helpful. So thanks Mia for, for dropping the sense of thing because it really does work. I've noticed my, product, my productivity has improved and I'm not like waiting till the last minute, like, oh crap, I got to get that done. I'm actually putting time in my calendar to get something done. And if I'm not happy with it. I can go back to it and tweak it, but it is, it is Hillary, a cool app. Hillary, did you actually, um, did you try the actual, um, so it comes with a, like a device that you put on your chest that actually calms the vagus nerve. So, so it's, it's linked to that. Um, so you can also get the device. I bought one for myself and, and my kids and um, the, the, you put the, device on your chest and, and it's every five minutes a day. So it starts to, um, I haven't done it um, consistently yet, um, but my daughter said it really helped her. And, and it's one of those things where it does the work without you really having to do anything. You just need to sit there. So, yeah. Yeah. I actually use, um, as you know, I love sound frequencies. So one of the things that's on the wakelet is a YouTube playlist I use for sound um, based on different moods or based on what I'm trying to do. Um, one of it's called solfeggio tones. So the different sound frequency numbers correlate to um, either like pain management or anxiety, depression, but there is vagus nerve frequencies, Mia, that I've used that I have found to be hugely helpful, especially if I'm getting dysregulated or I'm noticing, um, you know, uh, PTSD Patty, as I call her, likes to show up and, and run, wreak havoc on my brain, I will listen to that instead because that will bring me back to, um, you know, a, a sense of safety and calm and just peacefulness because PTSD will mess with your head and it's not fun and it's an ugly place to be if you're not being treated for it because you need to have both, but the AT supports in it you know, the tools that I've discovered for me, for my own person have helped tremendously. And, you know, some people need additional help in terms of therapy, sometimes medication, sometimes there's other supports that come into play. And all of those are, are great um, as well. So Alyssa's presenter. Ah, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Alex. So if you went to ATIA and you downloaded all the handouts, if you didn't, then there's your reminder to do that next year. Um, her handouts are in there. If you went to ATIA and I know I saw you reach out to me and I'll share the handout with you. Um, and then, um, or if you didn't just reach out and I'll share the handout with you, but there's a presentation she gave on YouTube. And then one that she did in previously for AAC in the cloud about AAC and relationships, which is like parallel corollary to what we're talking about. Um, and then her LinkedIn, um, it was really good. She's a researcher who also happens to be an AAC user, um, who also happens to have mental health challenges. So nice. Thank you, Alyssa. That's awesome. You know, telehealth too really opened up a lot of doors for people in terms of accessing, but of course, reliable internet and a HIPAA, you know, compliant connection. Uh, Microsoft Teams, I do believe, Alyssa, I sent you some stuff on Microsoft and Teams on HIPAA and their, their stance and approach to that. So that's also pretty cool um, in their suite because I know we've been using, we were using Zoom before and now they're they're they've got teams going and some other stuff but um there are HIPAA compliant platforms that you can use for that and I just want to make sure that that's the case there there's versions of zoom that are as well um when I did telehealth when you know if I if it was snowing or if I wasn't feeling well my therapist I would just oh let's just switch to remote and off you go because she was down the street so and then I won you know the, if you if someone's moved or whatever, then you can still access that, that particular person, but it does, or if you're medically, like you're homebound and you medically can't go, you can't get there or you don't have transportation, but you've got, you know, decent internet or your phone service is really good. You can get on, you know, telehealth and, and access that. And I think that as a form of tech and having that has really, really helped, I think, open up some access windows for people that might not normally go and access services that they need in, 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 you know, kind of doing that. And that insurance, you know, was playing along and saying, oh, well, it's COVID. And now I've got to follow this a little more carefully federally, like now that they're saying, oh, no more, but that doesn't diminish the fact that we still need telehealth. We still need to provide those services. And I'm seeing though that because of that, there are places that aren't just when they're providing them as options, which is actually really nice. So it's not just one or it can be both. And some of that's, you know, funded through grants or we're just making the stance that this is what we're doing because we can reach more people. Oh, the Sensate device. Another one too is heart math. Um, heartmath.com and it's a meditation based app but there is a device it's kind of some but it isn't about the vagus but what it does is it monitors like your heartbeat and all that and the global coherence so it really shows the community aspect of mental health and the community aspect of kind of caring for each other so you can get on these um they were free but then they have some paid where you can access a guided meditation at any time and it could be a global coherence and there could be any any one than one other person to hundreds of people listening at the same time and what it does is it monitors the global coherence of like collective consciousness and no we're not getting borgish here but it's more about like how everyone's connected so it's illustrating the point that we're all connected our humanity is what connects us and so in in having a guided meditation that's either wishing for peace or bringing out intentions for peace or, or mental health, improve mental health or healing for people. It really is powerful. I've done a few of those and that's been really like, if I've lost hope or I'm not feeling at my best. I've gone into that room a couple of times and picked a meditation that works. And that just, I don't know, there's something about it that just has helped. Alyssa, tell us more about my so mightier is kind of a gamification of emotional regulation. Yeah. Um, so it's tablet based, but it does have the, it, I just reminded me of it when she was talking about the heart sensor. So it has like an armband sensor um, and like it is subscription based, which I know school systems hate. Um, but I have had some parents um, that um, it's like one subscription gives you like up to five or six people that can use it. So I've had some families that have gotten in all three kids, you know, engage with it, but it's like game apps and you kind of learn 
some techniques for coping along the way. And then the other piece of it that I actually probably maybe even like more than the game is there's like a family, there's a parent app that kind of does some good parent education, um, not only of like what's happening in the game and what skills are they learning, but like bigger picture, like here's how it may apply to how you're working, parenting your kid. Um, nice. And it is research-based. I want to say boss. In university yeah boston children's hospital did a ton of research massachusetts general hospital did research um and their research is on the on the website about kind of what what places did it kind of help with reduction in outbursts kind of things um um that play-based intervention and how it applies to anger um i'm not necessarily always a screens fan um, but I have seen some kids that didn't respond to some, some typical interventions we would have used that did well with this. And it was wow. developed by some OTs, so can't go wrong with that. Great. All right. So I did put a while in the, I did put the wakelet up, but I'm adding those links, um, as well. So. Um, sometimes even just the, the art of practicing gratitude has been something that's been helpful. So if you're having a really like yuck day or things just are not going your way, it's like, all right, what's one thing. And sometimes it's like, oh, this awesome hand pen that I got from Mia that is a fidget that I can go, that just like made my day. Cause it's like, now I've got a built-in fidget. Hooray. Thank you. Um, but little things like some people you you start from like the littlest of things and then they become bigger things and then that just kind of that just kind of rolls I just remember my when my grandmother and my uncle were dying within weeks of each other I you know that's hard stuff but it was like okay in this hard what can I be grateful for in this day and it started with like one and then I noticed I was writing two then it was three and it was five then it was ten and then it was like wow, even in all of this yuck, there's a lot of yum in here. So I, I'm acknowledging there's some yuck, but I'm going to focus on some of the other stuff. I'm not denying that I feel a certain way about this, but sometimes for people with mental health challenge, you know, disorder or something like, you know, someone like me, like I'll obsess about it, the negative stuff. And I don't want to do that. So in breaking the pattern, it's acknowledging that that's not good and I'm okay, but Here's a lot of things that are good. And so there's that emotional regulation that we're talking about, right? That kids need from the very, very earliest of ages, you know? And it's not just this, I can do it growth mindset stuff. It's really about honoring people's unique perspectives, unique abilities, disabilities, and the representations that come and our shared experience as fellow human beings and being human and being humane towards each other. You know, sometimes I get dysregulated and I get, and I get punchy and I'm getting better saying, yeah, I'm getting a little punchy right now. Maybe I'm going to wait on sending that email. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Unless it's something that's really egregious and is very just blatantly discriminatory, then I'm going to call you in. Um, but in terms of managing, you know, mental health, that is something Um that's really cool, you know, that you just got to do. And I, you know, coming out of it, it was scary for a while, but I can empathize with kids and recognizing that a kid is acting out doesn't mean that they're bad. And, you know, in teaching a class um, recently that came out from the feedback from participants was I have these kids that are really challenging right now, like two in particular, and this course came at the perfect time because now I have some tools that I can use to help support them more effectively. And I know who my people are that I can use. And it's helping me to understand I'm not getting frustrated. I'm managing my emotional makeup because I'm the adult and I have to manage that because this person has a trauma history and is very dysregulated. And I need to get some supports in place for these, for these particular kids that could benefit everybody. So I'm just gonna make them part of my classroom design. You know, so these supports the wakelet. There's so many resources. Go through them. If you have questions, um, let's ask them now. If you want to talk some more about it, I'll just open up the floor because um, I only got 15 minutes left, but I wanted to make sure everyone had an opportunity to either participate in the chat or speak or share a story or 
talk about some AT that might be helpful that we haven't covered. Yeah, Jen, that's a really good point. There's such there's such a depth of re like why do we do this? Research tells us small class sizes really really impact also student well being, emergence, and then you've got staffing issues. Yeah, and that really does affect because that consistency. I think that's such a a point, just about even consistency and certainty. You know, the last years have really kind of messed all of that up. And so now, well, now what do I do? And so that really does impact. And if you have somebody that's not in a place to address that or a professional that is just in because you don't have the person and it's just a body, it doesn't become a safe learning environment in any way, shape or form. And you're just treading what you're just, it's, it's, there's no learning going on really. And that, and then we get into this learning loss kind of modality and that really I just think is about mental health and making sure that you're okay because like I said you can't learn if you're not available for it you know and some days are better than others you know so think about yourself some days you're like I can work and you tackle and then some days like not so much I'm gonna get the things that I could do on my list done instead of the should do's because I'm just not in that place but I'm not gonna feel guilty about it because to, to force yourself when you're not in a place to it just makes your mental health worse because you're not addressing what the issue is at hand. And there's no shame in not being able to do all the things all the time, former perfectionist talking. I think one of the things that we've noticed in our district is there's a lot of new initiatives and I think it comes from a lot of the COVID and learning loss and trying to catch students up and so our teachers are feeling very taxed and I think our more experienced teachers who have had time to address mental health issues are struggling because they have to stay on track they have to implement all these new new programs or tools or different things and so I think um again, it comes down to just even feeling like you have the time to address some of these in the classroom. Um, and I, you know, I, I look, we have a, a union um, sort of Facebook group, and I look at what some of the teachers are posting anytime a new initiative comes down the pipeline, everybody's commenting on how, you know, that's going to affect, you know, just the amount of time they have to spend with their students or the amount of time they have to, to differentiate um, for their learners so that, you know, maybe it is, a, it is addressing some of those mental health needs. Um, so I think districts, I mean, we have a huge SEL initiative and program that we've we've all been trained in this year and are really pushing out. But again, it comes back to teachers really feeling like they have the time to address it. And I think their mental capacity plays into that as well, um, because I see a lot of our teachers just really struggling with their own mental health issues. This school year, I always thought COVID was going to be the hardest years, and I feel like right now are the hardest years. Um, this year is like not one that I've ever experienced, and I'm just seeing so much staff burnout. So then on top of that, to try to have them addressing student burnout, I think, and, and their mental health issues just feels very, very overwhelming. Like Alyssa, our social workers, all of, the, they're just swamped. I mean, they can't keep up. Um, but every school I go into, there's always a student in the hallway, you know, running around screaming, totally melting down. Um, our behavior program support teachers are just like, just not enough time in the day ever. Our principals are spending all their time dealing with behavior and mental health issues. And so it's just, it, it feels very, very overwhelming this year. Again, unlike anything I've ever experienced in, in my career. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I've, you know, I, I still, even though I'm not 
in K-12 full time, I still am very much in touch with what's going on, listening to friends, talking to colleagues, you know, and hearing just that frustration, just what you're saying, like it's, it's too much. And I, I sense that like during COVID, like this is, this is going to really, you know, really be impactful. Like, what are we doing to help each other? You know? And sometimes it's, why can't we just take a step back and take a pause and say, Hey, you know what? (laughs) This has been really hard, but we're okay. Or we'll get it through it and maybe redesign or rethink learning opportunities and what that looks like so that it's not just like how it always was. I think there's this pressure to, to go back to how it, what you can't, you will never, you're, you're never the same from this experience, from that moment. No one is the same. Everybody has changed. And so trying to shuffle that out is really problematic when you're still trying to put old systems and old the, the pre on everything. So I think that's where that burnout is so coming from. I felt that so deeply. It was like, no, you've gone like 9,000 steps backwards and you're missing this golden opportunity to redesign education for kids. Like there were some kids that really thrive in distance learning. There were some kids that didn't, but for the kids that did and that was taken away as an option, That's another like flip of mental health challenges, right? Now I've got to deal with all of this and I can't learn because now I'm anxious and nervous. So instead of saying, hey, let's get some teachers, you know, that are teaching online and some that are, and we can provide and offer both and make that work and really get creative about that and give teachers some agency in that. I just, I I was like, how could you miss this cold and opportunity here to really get kids who are, you know, not, not doing very well, that were like meeting grade level standards at at IEPs because we changed the environment, we changed the learning environment. We didn't just expectations per se, we changed the learning environment to a virtual, and for some, they were great with that. I just don't get it. I think you, the, the word that just, you said that sort of resonated with me was agency. I think our teachers have lost agency and I think our students have as well. And I think that's what COVID provided for some of our students was, um, you know, we were utilizing more of that UDL, you know, there were multiple ways to show your knowledge. It was, you could comment, you could have your video camera off. You didn't have to be seen. I have a middle schooler in my house right now. And it's so apparent to me, like, you know, I, I showed her this shirt she could wear for track practice the other day and it said strong mind, body, and soul. And she's like, I can't wear that. It has words on it, mom. And I'm like, yeah, like good words. Like why? But it was just that, you know, like fear of being different from her peers. Whereas that again, like through COVID, you had some agency in, you know, like not having your camera off sure, you know, or having your camera off or, 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 you know, just again, participating in different ways. And I think we've gone back to that traditional lecture style of learning in some ways. And, you know, the, the, all the tools that we had, I just like, I walk into these classrooms and I'm like, why aren't they being used? You know, they were so successful for some of our students. And I just, I, I struggle with why, how, and why we can't get back to, to some of that, because some of it was so good. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you think some of that is because people can't, um, I don't want to say connect the dots, but I just said it out loud anyway. So connect the dots to that idea of I only did that because I was virtual and I'm here in a room. So clearly I don't do that now. Like, do you think they've, and it almost is like they're waiting for permission to use the creative solutions in the traditional setting. And if that doesn't come, they just kind of bounce out. Yeah, you know, for some of us, like our SLPs had so access to so many different supports Mm -hmm. at the time, and they got back to their classrooms and the materials that they had created virtually, suddenly they didn't have a screen to present that on to their students. And they're going to our admin saying, can I have some way to project all this material? You know, so I think some of it was just the tools were different in the classroom. Um, But again, I think I really think our staff are so overwhelmed and I don't think they can get 
beyond that overwhelmed feeling. It's sort of like Hillary, you were saying those tools, when you get overwhelmed, you shut down. And I think that shutdown is coming in the form of I'm going to do what I've always done and I'm comfortable with. And it, it comes back to we're putting too many demands on our teachers. We're trying too many new things. They just, they, they can't do it all. I, I, you know, and I look and I just feel so helpless because I'm like, Hey, can you implement this communication system? And they're looking at me like I'm crazy because they can't, they just can't add one more thing to their plate. So, you know, it, it's tricky. It's really, really hard. The other thing that I've noticed with some of the behaviors, I think some of our students, especially in more of our self-contained classrooms, our behaviors, physical behaviors have gotten over, out of control and um, very physically aggressive. And the way that our admin is responding to some of those are well, oh, I was hit, you know, why can't you be hit every day? You know, like, and it, and it's like, well, but that doesn't make it right. You, you know, you should, there should have been support for you when that student was physically aggressive too. So, you know, it, it's just, it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's such an overwhelming time right now, walking into a classroom, trying to support teachers. Yeah. I'm always very careful about what I say, but even in places that we do have staff that are willing, like one of the things that happened for us post pandemic is we had a lot of students who were being very successful in that like high flex. Like we did a year where most of our kids were back, but some of our kids were still at home. And then in the state of Florida, like it, that high flex doesn't count for that kid in their high school credit like it it doesn't and the funding is different so then districts were like well i'm not going to get funded the same and it's going to like it doesn't count for credits like why why are we continue that method so even in places where we had willing teachers because they had bought into hey this is working you know whether it's for a little pocket of kids or you know or a specific methodology we even have external kind of things that are saying well even if it's working and you're willing it's a no but I agree. I mean, I'm always, I, the, I walk into a classroom and I may have a thought about why I'm walking into that classroom, but the first question, how are you and what can I do to help? Um, because they're, they're not ready for, oh, and I need you to like, I no they, they got to get that part of it out first. And then most of them can get to the place where we can conquer whatever else we're needing to do for that specific learner or that classroom. But until that first, like, Okay, let's check in. How are you? What do you need? Go to the bathroom? Yes, please go to the bathroom and and then come back and we'll talk and I'll pretend to teach math until you come back. Um, <laughs> but they're just not in a place where they can do more. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember even, you know, shut that when we were shut down and coming back in, that was an active part. I would just make sure instead of, you know, not just being in a building, but physically going to every classroom and checking in on staff, not just, you know, Hey, there's this new AT thing. Great to see you, but what's going on here or setting myself up to go in and do something kind of fun that involves some tech that gave some pause, gave some relief, gave some joy back to, you know, what was happening. And sometimes that worked really well. And other times, you know, I, they couldn't, because like you said, they just not things are just not good, you know, and we're dealing with a lot of things. And it just, I think the bigger picture list is that you hit on is just supporting each other and acknowledging like, all right, you, and it's okay. Like it's a lot. And, and I do, I agree, Jen, that's, I feel teachers have been very dehumanized and disempowered. And this has been even before COVID. It's been coming for a long time. Um, and it, and it just, it's got to stop because it's taking away. I've been doing lesson plan design with teach currently like graduate, they're teachers and they're like, and done that, you know, I'm used to, here's my curriculum. Here's what I do. I'm like, that's not, but that's not teaching. There's, you have to know how to design lessons and learning opportunity. You have to as a teacher. And it's just, it's just, you know, it's gotta be done. Thanks Kelly, Kelly Fawner. Um, but I know we're at one. Uh, 101. So I don't want to hold up too much time because I could talk about mental health a lot longer than this and I won't. But you have the wakelet um, and this will be recorded. This is recorded. So please um, refer to it. And if there's other resources you have found to be helpful, please send them along. I'd love to add them um, and let's keep this conversation going, but keep um, 
light on mental health and the importance of taking care of yourselves too and taking care of each other. Um, so thank you all for your time and your contributions today. I appreciate you all so much, so much. What a fun hour. I'm kind of mad I had construction happening because I had to get up three times and I missed chunks, but I'll check the recording out. Um, awesome stuff. Any last thoughts before people head off to the rest of your day? Feeling better, feeling energized, feeling connected. Um, I think when, whenever I, we talk about this topic, I think of this group right here. I think of this idea, the concept of this. And I think back to that fateful day at the beginning of last year where I suggested maybe we don't do this anymore. And that went horribly wrong. And I've recognized the, 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 the power and the, the depth of this conversation every week. So Yeah, we were um, all on mute and yet you heard the resounding yeah, gas. It was, an un it was uncomfortable. I can sense it. I, I have a sixth sense that way. Yeah, I can figure that out. Um, Hillary, thank you. I will put the recording up um, between now and the next meeting I go to. If you missed our book study last week, I put the recording in the chat. It was really good to have that conversation. And our next book study is on May 8th. May 8th, chapters three and four in the book, Better Conversations. There it is. All right, that was all. That's all of my plugs. Anybody else got a plug you want to throw real fast? Well, then go back to work. Can I put the link in the chat for that? In the, in sure. what, the recording? Wow. No, the link for the book study for, is that what you're, yeah, for the book or for the book study session thing? What do you want, Mia? No, because if I don't sign up now, then I miss it. <laughs> oh, you want the link for the book study? All yeah, right, the link for the book study. Everyone else just remain calm for a second so we can accommodate um, Yeah, while he's, while he's putting the link in the chat, if anybody's bored tonight at 6.30 and wants to hop on Lesson Picks Live, you'll get Judy Schoonover and I hanging with the lesson picks people talking about OT month. Oh, I totally forgot too. There was a lot of good mental health stuff in lesson picks. Thanks for the lesson picks. What that's in there too. So good luck tonight, Alyssa and Judy. That's yeah, gonna be thanks. We just, awesome. sit, we just sit there and answer questions that Bill asks. There's really no prep. It's like this group, no prep, show up, talk about things. It's gonna be a great session. Right, me, you got the link? Well, then I guess we're done then. What else is there? I mean, me is all squared. We're all good. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was great. Hillary, thank you. That was an awesome conversation. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of the day. See y'all.